Hey there, Extra Historians. Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the things we left out, the stuff we got wrong, and why asking if someone is a terrorist might be very good for YouTube engagement while also uh, being historically insightful. I'm Rob, I'm the head writer of Extra History, and we're here to talk about John Brown. This was a really cool series. I've wanted to do it for a while, and I'm really gratified how well all of you responded to it and how interested uh, you were. The series did really well and was made me very happy because I've been saying for a long time, like, we need to do John Brown. John Brown would be such a good series. Um, so thank you for tuning in, but especially thank you if you're a patron. Patrons make lies possible, and this is really important to continue the historical conversation. I think it's an integral part of the show. I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would want to do extra history if we didn't have this time. Uh, if you want to jump on our next series, Napoleon in Egypt 1 is out on Nebula. We're part of the Nebula First program. They've uh, allowed us to get ahead long enough that we can put them up a week early. Uh, so you can jump on that. That's going to be a really fun series. Nick's done a really great job with the art. Recommended reading for this topic is Patriotic Treason, John Brown and the Soul of America by Evan Carton. Uh, all these books are really big, but this book is specifically kind of a banger. Um, it it's doesn't, doesn't feel as long as it is. Uh, John Brown, Abolitionist, The Man Who Killed Slavery, Sparked a Civil War and Seated Civil Rights by David S. Reynolds. To Purge This Land with the Blood, A Biography of John Brown by Stephen B. Oates. Uh, and... I do want to mention uh, The Good Lord Bird is a... I have not read it because I don't mix historical fiction or movies with my uh, research reading, but um, I'm definitely... I read a couple chapters in and it's very good. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the Showtime series as well, which is supposed to be great. And the final one is John Brown's War Against Slavery by Robert E. McGlone. I have a special connection to this topic in that uh, the historian who wrote this book, Robert McGlone, was my history professor at University of Hawaii. It was actually the only American history course I took at UH was his Civil War course, and he did a large section on John Brown because he was a Brown specialist. And he really kind of opened my eyes to what an interesting figure Brown was and how he's not really fully appreciated in a way he should be. And not necessarily in the in sense of like whether he was a hero or not, because if you watched our Frederick the Great Lies episode, I think we should look at historical figures and say they had heroic actions, not that they were heroes. Because I think when you put someone up on a pedestal, it, it tends to kind of mean that you don't do as good a job uh, in analyzing them. Because you start to try and say that they were heroic in all things, whereas just understanding that people are complicated. Um, but Professor McGlone was, he was so, so attached to this period in history emotionally. You know, he'd, he'd choke up and, and cry when lecturing, when he talked about the Lincoln assassination or, or Brown or uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and I really think that a lot of this series is, is owed to Professor McGlone, uh, who sadly passed away in 2015. But... Thanks, Professor. I do want to point out this hero or terrorist debate. Is it a little bit like YouTube hooky? Yes, but this is a really, really common debate with John Brown, particularly when I went to college. So I was in school in 2003 to 2007 doing my history degree. So that was like prime war on terror years, right? So this was a big deal at the time looking at various historical figures and events and saying like, is this terrorism? What can we understand about this through the lens of terrorism. And the reason that you ask a question like this is not necessarily to jump to an answer. It's what does the question reveal about your subject that you maybe didn't see before? And something Professor McGlone liked to point out is that John Brown, if you look at him through the modern lens of a terrorist, we'll complicate that in a second, he's very modern, right? He tries to use fear to achieve a political end in the Potawatomi, Potawatomi Massacre, right? A, a public violent act to, to try and um, sway a, a political uh, movement. He takes hostages. He courts media and tries to get his message out. He 
does that kind of like um, propaganda of the deed, right? And he, uh, he gets a veteran guerrilla fighter from another conflict to come over and train his strike team at a training camp. He really does like seem like a very modern uh, person in understanding what we would today call terrorism. But it's really important to remember that terrorist at that time didn't mean someone who was like a, an independent actor. Um, it generally meant someone who was state-sponsored uh, and was going through an act on behalf of a state. So John Brown wouldn't really be considered a terrorist at this time. He would be like a guerrilla leader or a bushwhacker. Um, whereas something like the Confederate agents that were supposed to set a bunch of fires and burn down New York City, that they would be terrorists or an act of terrorism. I'm not comparing those two. I'm just saying that's the kind of thing at this time where you would use the label terrorist. We understand a little differently now. Uh, another question that Professor McGlone would go into quite a bit was whether John Brown was mentally ill. He believed in very, very deeply and argued very persuasively that, that Brown was not mentally ill. Um, I'll actually link a, an article he wrote that's online uh, about this. But Brown had periods of grief and depression that were very deep. We talked about some of them. People in his family clearly suffered from... Uh, from some mental health struggles like Frederick um, or John Jr. had w what was likely post-traumatic stress disorder due to being captured and, and tortured during Bleeding Kansas. But um, Brown doesn't really seem to uh, display any signs of mental instability. Some, some Victorian authors would kind of like use this language, coded language of madness about Brown, saying he had a gleam in his eye, or they'd find a um, letter he wrote that, that said, like, it feels like my head is going to explode. But it seems like in the latter case, he was talking about, you know, a sinus infection. Um, and uh, there are letters his family writes when he's being tried, claiming that he is mentally ill, but that's to bolster an insanity defense, right? and uh, one that Brown did not want at all. And also, the thing that they're claiming that he had is monomania. This is a made-up Victorian diagnosis, kind of in a similar way if you've heard of hysteria. This is a little bit similar. They would say this about people who had very deeply held beliefs that were out of the mainstream. Monomania meant you were sane in all other aspects except on this one topic. So. What they would say, literally, was Brown is a sane man in everything except slavery. You know, he, he's very on the level. He's very, you know, he's very sound, except, you know, he thinks black people are really people and shouldn't be enslaved and that it's okay to use violence to liberate them. So uh, I'll link that article. It's very good. Um... I do want to point out that some of this is not so much a North-South issue. Franklin Pierce, who is the president, the, the pro-slavery president during Bleeding Kansas, he's from New Hampshire, right? And we talk about William Lloyd Garrison nearly being lynched by a crowd of 1,500 people. That's in Boston, right? Massachusetts is like the hotbed of abolitionism, and you still have 1,500 people that will storm into uh, a lecture of the prom most prominent abolitionist at the time and try to have him tar and feathered. Um, so... There's a lot of variation. In fact, even in Brown's militia company, while Brown is off, you know, doing the Potawatomi massacre, uh, his son, uh, John Brown Jr., decides that he's going to raid this homestead and liberate a bunch of slaves. And he does. And his militia company gets so upset about this because they're like, well, you know, that's not really legal. They are their property. Um... We're here to, like, stop the spread of slavery, but we're not necessarily just trying to end slavery outright. And they force him to give them back, which is very upsetting uh, to John Jr. So there is a big difference between abolitionists who think that slaves should be freed, abolitionists who thinks that um, slaves should be free and have equal political rights, and abolitionists who think that uh, freedmen should have equal political rights and that we're morally, spiritually, and... Uh, ethically 
equal to white people. Like, this is a huge range, even among what's considered like the wildly, you know, fire-eating abolitionists. Uh, episode one, YouTube question. You didn't mention that one of John Brown's father's apprentices at the tannery was Jesse Grant, the father of Ulysses S. Grant. Yes, I sometimes joke that America feels real small during this period. Uh, also, Jeb Stewart, who is a famous Confederate cavalry commander and is the guy who negotiates with Brown uh, right at the siege at the engine house when the Marines come. He has met Brown previously during Bleeding Kansas. He's one of the U.S. Army troopers that is kind of overseeing this prisoner exchange uh, after Brown captures a bunch of prisoners at the Battle of Blackjack, and he turns them over hoping to get his son, who is also a prisoner, exchanged. Jeb Stewart is one of the guys who is brokering that. Um, so it's, it's so weird, all these connections. America was very small at the point, at that point. Someone said, I love when you animate some scenes. It's probably really hard to do, but it looks really good. Uh, thank you. Allie really did an amazing job on this series. I know she has um, had a lot of passion for this one, and uh, I, I really can't commend her enough. She also found a, uh, a American history textbook recently that was owned by her great-great-grandfather, who was a school teacher in a one-room schoolhouse. And there was a section about John Brown, which was pretty good, actually, much better than I expected. Episode two, YouTube question, allowing slavers to capture runaway slaves simply by verbal claims. Man, I can't see this being abused in any way. Yeah, and that happened. Um, if you saw or read uh, 12 Years a Slave, this is how Northup is, is taken. He's conned into thinking that he's going to uh, be given work. He is kidnapped. He has papers of someone else attached to him legally where they claim that, like, here's our papers saying that, like, this guy is, is an escaped slave. Um, and he's uh, taken, taken south. I mean, as a slave there for a dozen years, uh, even though he was born free. So this was literally a license for slave catchers and con men to just lie and, and grab people off the street and sell them south. Um, and there was violent opposition to this. We talked about that a little bit when we talked about the raiders that, you know, mobs would break into jails where people were being held to be taken south and, and just liberate them. As a Kansan myself, I'm very excited to learn about this period of bleeding Kansas, because it was tragically glossed over in my school when we learned about the Civil War. Yeah, it was really glossed over for me too. Of course, I'm from Hawaii, so a little bit of a, a little bit of a difference there, obviously. This some of this stuff can seem very far away and a long time ago when you when you grew up that that far away from the American center. Um, but yeah, this stuff, in my opinion, is not very well taught uh, in schools. And I think it's some of the most interesting parts of the Civil War, actually. I, I wish there was more attention paid to the lead up to the Civil War and Reconstruction, because um, it's really neglected and very interesting and vital periods of history. Um, someone said, I don't want to nitpick, but it's a little weird that you used bolt action rifles uh, instead of more area appropriate repeaters or breech loaders. Um, yeah, so when you see something like this, Generally, what that means is that something went wrong and we are deep enough in the process that it could not be fixed by the time we had to start working on the next episode because we have a very tight production type pipeline as a uh, weekly show. And if I remember right, someone got sick in this episode, uh, ended up being delivered late. Um, and by that time, we noticed the mistake, but it was like, we can't. We can't fix this without delaying the next episode. And then there's like a train car pileup, right? Um, so we just made the decision that we had let it through for this episode and we did fix them the next episode. Um, there was actually two things like that, unusually, uh, in that I caught a mistake I made, but it was too late to fix because it would have in involved rewriting parts of the script, re-recording it, redoing the art. And we just didn't, we just didn't have the ability at that point, um, which is that Brown's vow to destroy slavery happened in his father's church in Hudson, Ohio, not after moving to Springfield. I misremembered that um, and, and misnoted it. I noticed it too late and just the redo would have, would have taken too much time. So I always plan to talk about it here because also there's been some debate about what exactly was said at that. It seems that, so we did a very like print the legend version of it, right? 
So these are his words that are often uh, stated that this is what he said. Um, John Jr. remembers it differently, right? He remembers it a little more qualified. Like, I will do everything in my power, you know, to, uh, to defeat slavery or to counter slavery. It doesn't seem it was like this rock solid. Um, so it seems like this was embellished a little bit after his death, which people really wanted to do. Um, California was admitted to balance, wasn't admitted to balance out Texas. That was Iowa. California actually threw off the balance, um, hence why its request for admission caused the crisis in 1850. Uh, ultimately, this balance was preserved by an agreement that one pro-slave and one free state senator would be sent to Congress. Uh, the main parts of the Compromise of 1850 were, one, California comes in as a free state, uh, but with a pro-slavery senator. The slave trade, but not slavery itself, would be banned in District of Columbia. Texas would be reduced in size, and along with the non-California portions of the Mexican secession, uh, shall become the new, the new Mexico and Utah territories, which allow slavery, and for the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, he also mentioned that, like, territories aren't states, just that's a normal thing. But to me, like, one of the reasons they kept them territories was so that it wouldn't throw off the balance, right? Territories to this day do not get to, they get to send non-voting representatives. So if you live in American Samoa or the Mariana Islands or Puerto Rico, you have a representative in Washington, but they don't get to vote. Episode three, YouTube question. Senator Charles Sumner spent the next three years barely able to leave his bed in severe pain from brain trauma. During this time, the governor of Massachusetts not only refused to replace his vacant seat, but the people of Massachusetts re-elected him. They found the empty seat a powerful symbol to the nation of the violence and brutality of the slaveholder. Um, yeah, another thing about the caning is, you remember how Brooks broke his cane? He was sent hundreds of new canes by Southerners. Like, this was a very popular move in the South. Um, so this was, again, like, it's just part of this cycle, this this increasing cycle of bad blood and um, reprisals that people would see that and be like, great, you know, here's another cane so you can do it again. Um, after the assault, a Massachusetts legislator and friend of Sumner, Anson Burlingame, gave a speech attacking Brooks and goaded Brooks into challenging him to a duel. When Brooks did so, because Burlingame, as the challenge party, was allowed to pick the weapons and the location, uh, he picked Niagara Falls, Canada, and the uh, and hunting rifles as the weapons. Now, Burlingame was a really infamously great shot, and Brooks basically melted and backed down and thought that he would be killed, probably. Um, so he backed out by saying that it was not safe for him to travel through the north to get to Canada. Um, but actually, the next year, he died a really gnarly death by a lung infection. So not really sad about that. A lot of folks felt we were being unfair calling the Potawatomi Massacre an escalation. I mean, it is an escalation, right? That's how things work, is that there is this act of violence and there's a reprisal that is sometimes greater, and then the reprisal for that becomes greater. And you know, the, the, the thing about escalating violence is that it makes it more and more difficult to calm it down. But I mean, I don't think it's controversial to say that if there is a, one free stater killed and then Brown goes and kills five um, pro-slavery advocates or border ruffians. Um, I don't. I, don't, I think that that's yeah, that's an escalation. Um, I really wanted us to understand his motives in doing that and his understanding of it and his fear for his family. Um, and a lot of things like the sacking of Lawrence. The sacking of Lawrence is terrible. But only one person is killed, and it's a border ruffian who gets hit by a brick by their, frankly, meat-handed attempt to blow up the Free State Hotel, right? So there's all this property damage, but except for this one guy who's killed accidentally, no one's really hurt that badly. Um, and while we do have this story about a Free Stater and uh, 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 pro-slavery uh, neighbors that the, the pro-slavery neighbor killed as uh, abolitionist, uh, neighbor. It's not clear that their main conflict was over slavery. I suspect that there may have been uh, property issues that were exacerbated by uh, the political climate. That's often how these things happen. So that's more of like a Hatfield-McCoy-ish thing than um, necessarily a political killing. 
Though again, like those motives could be mixed. But this is my thing about Brown. I really think the Potawatomi Massacre is different from any other thing Brown does. And I feel like if you went and read about it, you would feel that more as well. And to me, there's three things that make it different. First, this is the only time, the only time Brown's objective was to kill people. In general, he tried to do things in ways that people weren't killed. Um, when he makes that raid that's like a little bit of a dry run for Harper's Ferry, and a slave owner is, is, pulls a gun and is killed, they don't like that, and he gets a lot of flack for that. And the raider who killed that guy, as he's waiting for execution, he basically says, that's the only thing I actually feel bad about having done, is I, I wish I hadn't, you know, have had to shoot this, this old guy who pulled a revolver. It's not usual for Brown's objective to be just taking lives. Um, he concealed his role in it to Northern benefactors, to admirers, uh, even to members of his militia. He wouldn't tell his militia company what he was doing. He just said, I have a special operation and I'd like to take these men. And then he disappeared. And they figured it out real quick. And a lot of them were not very happy with him as a result. Um, but there was clearly something about this that even when he before he did it, he felt like it was a little bit beyond the pale. And then after he did it, he kind of regularly would not very convincingly deny that that he was involved. And a lot of people in the North kind of turned a blind eye. They sort of chose to believe him. And of course, he knew the Doyles. Like, this is a mix of political and personal, like we talked about before. They're his neighbors. And listen, like, Doyle and his sons may have been, like, nasty folks, but that's not as clear-cut a line of, like, I am doing this in order to free slaves, in order to prevent slavery in Kansas, there's also an element of, I am trying to protect my family. I feel threatened by these people. So it gets muddy, like the motives get muddy. It just does. Um, so it's much less clear cut than say the raid on Harper's Ferry or his uh, raids of direct liberation. And uh, I think it's important to point that out, you know? Episode four, any battle plan that includes the phrase, and then people will rise is a bad plan. <laughs> yes. However, in fairness, um, he mostly designed his plan from the Nat Turner revolt, where an armory was also seized, um, and the Haitian Revolution, where that worked, right? The Haitian Revolution, you have these, go watch our series on it, you have these people that go out and try and raise a force of enslaved people rebelling, and that was supposed to be Harriet Tubman's role but she's ill. She had health struggles throughout her entire life, including some kind of epileptic-like symptoms, probably from a head injury she sustained while uh, escaping slavery. So this kind of stuff had actually worked before. Obviously, Nat Turner Revolt is put down, but they get the weapons. Um, and also, Harper's Ferry is part of Virginia that is, has a much larger anti-slavery, or at least not rapidly pro-slavery population. So he had some feeling that, like, maybe people just wouldn't oppose him. Um, and indeed, Harper's Ferry is now in West Virginia because secession was considered so, uh, so beyond what people wanted at the, uh, in that area that, uh, that it stayed with the Union, partially because a lot of the people that would have wanted to secede were off in the Confederate Army at that point. Someone said, Frederick the Great's sword is the new Walpole confirmed. Yes, if you didn't watch our Frederick the Great lies, this is not actually Frederick the Great's sword. People thought it was at the time, but it's not. Uh, someone said, thank you for illustrating Lewis Sheridan Leary as mixed. It's a distinctive experience that's often swallowed up or erased in a larger story. Yeah, a, a lot of people who were, uh, who were black were of mixed heritage at this point. Um, Frederick Douglass, you know, has a white father. Um, and... Uh, it's an important part of the American experience. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's good to show that that's not, it's not like a one side, the other side thing. Um, but um, I do want to mention that John Brown's constitution that has full racial and gender equality, gender equality, that's kind of weird. Doesn't seem like Brown would be into that sort of thing. He's very, very biblical. Well, of course he's staying with Frederick Douglass, who is a part of the French Seneca Falls Conference and who's a big proponent of giving women the vote. 
And that's probably Frederick Douglass uh, rubbing off on him. I really want to do a Frederick Douglass series. He's been on The Vote before, but he's really, really fascinating. Someone had a, a very interesting comment about the uh, amounts a uh, Dangerfield newbie raised to buy back his family, uh, adjusted for inflation, and uh, $1,500 would be around 54000 US dollars today. Um, but there's another source that claims he'd only made a deal to free his youngest son for the equivalent of 36,000 US dollars. And he had only been able to raise the equivalent of 26,000 or 27,000 US dollars um, at the time of joining Brown's group. And yeah, he was, he was literally on the clock, Dangerfield knew, but he knew his family was gonna get sold further south if he didn't get them out now. Someone said, I don't, know, I don't know how many times I've been to Harper's Ferry, but I also know that I never had any idea Harriet Tuplin was involved in this raid. Yeah, well, her role just didn't end up happening. Again, like she had these health struggles throughout her life, and they just ended up catching her at a time when she couldn't get out of bed. Um, so I don't know if things would have gone differently if she had, but it's an interesting thing to um, think about. Someone said, wasn't Stonewall Jackson, this is episode five, Dead by the end of the war, yes, but that's why we say neither he nor any other Confederate officer um, were tried for treason. Had he survived, he would not have been. Um, in fact, even the effort to prosecute Lee basically fell apart. Um, at one point, uh, we actually had as, as a voting option on the Patreon, kind of like Confederate war trials and what, why was nobody uh, tried for treason. Um, even Jefferson Davis, you know, he was uh, kept under a kind of house arrest with his family, and eventually the charges against him got dropped, and he was able to kind of write his memoirs that partially kind of rehabilitated his reputation. And he also became a president of the college. Um, and by the way, the guy that got him, kind of saw his memoirs into publication, was a journalist named Redpath, who was the guy who was in Kansas with John Brown, uh, and, and making his reputation in northern newspapers. So you do, again, it's not so like people on one side, people on the other side. You have this very, very uh, strong abolitionist that is helping Jefferson Davis publish this memoir that burnishes his reputation. Um, also at the execution was John Wilkes Booth, who had bribed this soldier so that he could wear his uniform to get into it because it was military only. So... Yeah, I would like to do a series on Booth, too. He's a, he's a creepy dude. Like, he's just circling all this stuff the whole time and clearly has some kind of complex about the fact that he didn't serve in the Confederate Army. Um, I do really want to mention that it's starting to become more studied what a big role conspiracy theories played in the outbreak of the Civil War. You know, the South is just awash in these fevered reports that like large slave rebellions are about to happen. There are wildfires in Texas that are blamed on escaped slaves uh, setting light the fields. There's all sorts of stuff like like this. Just It's just everywhere to the point that some Southern newspapers are like, guys, the revolt failed. Like nobody turned up. Like John Brown threw a, a revolution party and nobody came. And they actually claim that this shows that the slaves in the South are content and happy and that John Brown's raid should, if anything, reassure Southerners that slavery was in a strong position. During the Civil War, a Union Army doctor managed to recover Owen Brown's uh, skeleton from the classroom and kept it for a while in a bag <laughs> until he finally was like, I should get this back to John Brown's family. So now Owen's skeleton was buried uh, in the family plot next to his father in North Elbe, New York. Um, and they also dug up the mass grave. And because the raids were not identifiable, they were all also buried in the Brown family plot, all the raiders together. Um, so that's, that's a feature I would like to go there, actually. Coming up on Extra History, we have Napoleon in Egypt and the Crimean War, which is a really interesting story given current events, uh, and the history of Buddhism. I am, oh, I'm really enjoying writing about Buddhism and getting to talk about like things like Buddhist hell um, and the, the demons of Mara attacking the Buddha and stuff. Oh, it's going to be a great series. Um, and next, we are voting on, uh, on the next topic. 
where I'm about to look at what people, um, what people suggested. If you want to become a patron and suggest topics and vote on topics, uh, you can head over to our Patreon. Now, Ibn Battuta's side trip, let's talk about Battle Hymn of the Republic, my favorite historical song. It has changed quite a bit over the years. It's been a very, very popular song. Um, frequently, uh, it's now sung, um, as he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free, uh, particularly outside military contexts, um, because that kind of uh, martyrdom language is not always as appealing to people. <laughs> Um, but I, I just think it's a fascinating song when you go into all of the kind of biblical references it makes. It's this apocalyptic language, this dramatic apocalyptic language. And, um, I, I really think personally that it would not have the same flavor if it was not originally a song about John Brown. I really think Julia Ward Howe, who was a big fan of John Brown, kind of took his language um, and wove it in. And even though it doesn't mention John Brown, I really consider that a John Brown song, or at least a John Brown inspired song. Um, and of course it's been adapted many times since. Solidarity Forever is, uh, is, is, is a union song, the union makes us strong. Um, and it was originally a, uh, it was originally a hymn that was sung in camera revivals. So John Brown's body was not even the original. <laughs> this is a lot of American songbook is like reinterpreting this one song over and over again. Um, but I, there's a verse that is not generally included, which really to me gets to the heart of what this song is about. And uh, it is, uh, he has sounded out the trumpet that will never sound retreat. He is sorting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Uh, our God is marching on. And literally, right, last judgment type language there. And which side are you going to be on? And, and that type of thing. And again, like that fell out of use because that language is so strong that in, uh, in the 1900s, people were like, mm, Maybe that's a little too religious for this song, uh, but I, I go go listen to the um, uh, uh, army band playing it. It's amazing. Um, thanks a lot. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 